The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the gate, from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. A stranger, you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, you cared for me. In prison, you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And then the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did for me. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for you, for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. And then they will answer and say, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or ill or in prison, and not minister to your needs? And he will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So happy Feast of Christ the King. We arrive at the end of the church year, one week before the first Sunday of Advent and the start of a new church year. So today is a joyful Sunday. It's also the Sunday prior to Thanksgiving Day when we gather around family tables to express our gratitude for the people who, who make our lives so rich. This Sunday, may, this Thanksgiving may be a little different this year because of relatives unable to travel, the need to maybe uh, keep, keep it more low-key than in the past because of the pandemic. I do again want to just uh, thank our pastor, Father McLaughlin, for this kind invitation to celebrate Mass with you on the feast Accompanying me on the altar is uh, one of our seminarians who did the two readings, uh, one of the seminarians from St. Joseph's in Yonkers. Uh, Dennis Gannon is in his second year of theology, and he's preparing to serve as a priest in the Diocese of Rockville Center. So please pray for Dennis. He's a very generous and devout young man. And pray for his brother seminarians, who have all responded uh, to God's call at a difficult moment in the life of our nation and church. All of them, like Father Michael Conley, your parochial vicar, are men of faith, even as they come from a generation for whom, well, the light of faith has dimmed and in some cases gone out. So today I'm, I'm asking you to pray for vocations to the priesthood. So the cards that you've been given or will be given as you leave church, little vocation cards that you could put in the hands of 
some young person whom you feel might be, might be called to the priesthood. But as importantly, I'm asking for you to pray for a return to faith among young people in our communities. Vocations to the priesthood, like vocations to marriage, come out of families that are centered on God and the practice of religion at home and in church. Still ringing in my ears from last week's gospel is that question that Jesus puts to his disciples. When the Son of Man returns at the end, will he find any faith on the earth? It's up to all of us to answer this question by working hard as we, as, as we can to, to bring into the homes of the people we care, up, care about the presence of God. Talk about God. Talk about the importance of prayer to God. This year's pandemic and all the protests and the political campaigns, it's been a difficult year. And it's left many people asking, on what can I finally rely in my life? What can I finally trust? Who can I trust? Who will guide me through all this chaos? It's a time when people's questions become spiritual. And there's an opportunity, more often than we think, to help people answer those questions for themselves. Well, today's readings give us a powerful image of the shepherd, the shepherd. Our responsorial psalm, sung so beautifully by our two cantors, uh, is read at so many funerals and wakes. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Beautiful words. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. He leads me. He gives me rest. He guards me. And he feeds me when I am hungry. What all that means is that when all the securities in life begin to dissipate, God is always there to uphold me. The shepherd is always there to restore my joy. And the psalm ends with that beautiful assurance that even, even though we pass through the shadow of the valley of death, we nonetheless find everlasting dwelling place in the house of the Lord. God has a place prepared for us. Tradition associates Psalm 23 with King David, who had grown up a shepherd and later became a king who labored through many, many battles, many struggles to unite his people. And at the end of his life, one imagines old David praying this psalm to renew his own confidence in God, who had seen, who had seen him through so many personal trials and labors on behalf of the people whom he had loved and for whom he made so many sacrifices. Psalm 23 is a good psalm to sing and to pray during difficult trials, trials of illness, trials of, of loss. Jesus describes himself as a good shepherd at key moments in the Gospels. I love chapter 10 of the Gospel of John where he describes himself as the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. He's the shepherd who teaches us, teaches all of his disciples how to love as he loves so that they can share in eternal life with him and the Father. Same Jesus calls others to be shepherds, parents to shepherd their children, men today, young men, to shepherd communities like this beautiful parish of St. Columba, to be priest shepherds who, who desire to live a heroic life of self-sacrifice and guide others along the path that leads to eternal life. When I asked one of our revered elder priests in Brooklyn, he had inspired many vocations to the priesthood over the years. He's a, a wonderful priest who is a real spiritual companion for other priests. 
I asked him, Monsignor, what is it that you look for in a young man who might have the call to serve in this way? And he shot back to me, he said, someone who is generous. First of all, generous with his own family and then with the parish community that becomes his other family. Generosity, generosity of spirit is the sign of a, of a vocation. Not only a vocation in the church, but also a vocation to family life. To cultivate generosity is, I think, one of the great challenges for all of us with respect to our young people. So I ask you today, as the rector of the seminary, do you know of any generous young men like Father Michael and Dennis and others? I know of 62 generous young men at the seminary in Yonkers. And I would dare to say that you would welcome any one of them into your home here at St. Columbus. Each one of our seminarians has the heart of the Good Shepherd, as shown very often in the lives they've lived prior to coming to seminary. Some of them were teachers. I think of one who was a teacher in the inner city and was so devoted to his profession and to the families of the young people who went to this school in a very difficult area. A few of them worked in health care. One was a lawyer, but none of us hold that against him. <laughs> Along whatever path they traveled, God was preparing them secretly to be shepherds teachers of faith, celebrants of the sacraments, and shepherds of wonderful communities like this one. The ideal shepherd whom Jesus describes in the Gospels is the one who has compassionate eyes. Compassionate eyes. He sees individuals in need and responds immediately to them, swiftly, promptly. Think of the shepherd who leaves behind the 99 sheep in his flock to go in search of just one that became lost. And when he finds it, he puts that lamb on his shoulders and he celebrates with his neighbors, his co-workers. He celebrates. Good priests are good shepherds who have an eye for seeing the image of God in everyone, but especially in those who are hurting, hurting from some affliction. Maybe it was self-imposed. They got into trouble. Or maybe they were harmed by someone else. Today's shepherds must have compassionate eyes, must see the image of God in every person, even those who are unpleasant. In this year's gospel for the feast of Christ the King, Jesus tells his parable about the final judgment when he returns at the end. And notice that as a king, he is called a shepherd king. He calls himself a shepherd king who, like the herdsmen of today's Middle East, often typically allow the sheep and the goats to graze together. They're mixed together, just like the sheep and the goats are in the world today. They're mixed together. But when it comes time for the harvesting, the wool from the sheep, the goat's milk from the goats, the two groups have to be separated. And so they are separated in the story. The sheep, in this case, are those who carry out the saving works of mercy, whereas the goats are without mercy toward the hurting whom they meet. But notice that both the good and the bad, the sheep and the goats, ask the same question of the shepherd king. When did we see you hungry or thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, or in prison? When? When? Both did not know that Jesus was hiding in such needy people. Imagine you and I who believe in Christ often miss him. We often miss him in places where he hides, where he hides, where he's in disguise. That is among the least of his brothers and sisters 
the most humble, the most lowly. Though we listen to the gospel every week, we forget that an essential fruit of faith is the love that puts God's word into action on behalf of the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters. St. John of the Cross says so beautifully, in the evening of life, my brothers and sisters, we will be judged by our love, by our love. So at the end of the day, that is really why we need priests. They help us find Jesus in those places in our own lives where he is hiding, in the people in whom he hides. Far from having left us 2,000 years ago, Christ is among us all the time. In fact, he's waiting to be found, to be clothed, to be fed, to be visited, to be given quality time in prayer. He is in our midst this very moment. He is in this church building. Jesus is here, here. Men studying for the priesthood are told many times in the course of their journey preparing to be ordained ministers. Many times we repeat this to, to them. Live every day in the presence of God. Live every day in the presence of God. And that's what we try to help them do through their studies, through their formation. That's what we try to help them do. Acquire the eyes of the heart to see Jesus in everyone, but especially in the needy. So friends, pray for our seminarians. Pray for more of them. Pray too for their generation that many more young people among our families and friends may have the joy of knowing and loving Jesus, our Shepherd King.